Hello and welcome to this video on perception. The mind concerns itself with three basic sorts of cognitions. These cognitions are about the past, present, and future. We know them as memory, perception, and imagination, respectively. This lecture is about perceptions of the present. We'll see that most perceptions are fraught with error. And in this lecture, we'll discuss perceptions of the self, a general theory that is used to understand perceptions of others, and some major errors that people make with their perceptions. Let's get started. An understanding of perception should probably start with how we perceive ourselves. There are several theories of the self with which we should be concerned, and each concerns a different construct. A construct is a latent or unseen thing that exists but can be interpreted through observable phenomenon. Intelligence is a construct. You can't see it or feel it, but it exists in the form of an ability to solve problems, which we can see. We can measure that ability. Personality traits are constructs. You can't see, feel, smell, or taste them, but they exist and are measurable by examining or reporting behavior that is thought to emanate from them. At the top of this typology, we have the construct of self-concept. This entails an overall perception of who we are and how we feel about ourselves. We view ourselves in many different realms. There is the deeply personal realm concerned internally with our personality, emotions, and cognitions. We also view ourselves in a social realm in terms of how we engage with others at work, on a team, or as part of the larger society. Self-concept is the central construct in how we perceive ourselves. There are multiple components or parts of self-concept, as we shall see. The first component of self-concept is self-enhancement, which primarily involves validating our self-concept. Self-enhancement is an amplification of our self-concept with some evolutionary psychological advantages that drive us as a species to take chances when necessary and to aim high when we need to. It's only natural to think that we are better at some things than we technically are, or else why would we never even try these things? Many of which are actually necessary for our survival. But are we as good as we think we are? Are we indeed better than even we think we are? This is reminiscent of the Prairie Home Companion radio show's opening line by its host, Garrison Keeler. Welcome to Lake Wobegon, where all the children are above average. If there is an average on anything, then some people are below it and some are above it, so it's simply not possible for everyone to be above average. There is ample empirical evidence of an increase in narcissism and entitlement amongst many young people nowadays as compared to generations gone by. Many more people, particularly young people today, believe that they are truly special and deserving of more than everyone else, regardless of their own effort, performance, or contribution. This is largely because of how they were raised as children. Smaller family sizes, a near complete eradication of corporal punishment, and helicopter parenting has created a generation or two that are sometimes delusional in their pursuit of self-enhancement. Of course, it is normal to want to see ourselves in a favorable light. We may use others to reinforce our own perception, but this theory of the self really only requires the self and is not predicated on the perceptions of others. Self-enhancement does not involve the perception of other people, and it results in a positive increase in how we see ourselves. The next component of self-concept is self-verification which does involve the perception of other people with the goal of having others see us as we see ourselves. For better or worse, we need others to perceive us as we perceive ourselves. This is an effort at confirmation of one's self-concept. For example, people who perceive themselves as being physically tough want others to see them as tough. Those who think of themselves as being charitable want others to see them giving to the needy. People who delight in being mean to others need to have others see them as legitimately mean. For example, there was once a TV show called about prison life called Lock Up or something. The TV interviewer would interview prisoners on death row who seemed actually quite proud of their evil crimes. 
They exclaimed boastfully what an evil person they are. This too may be an evolutionary adaptation. Consider the harsh life of prison for a moment. Everyone in there is bad or evil, or both. All have committed crimes. The prison hierarchy tends to place the worst and most evil at the top. Sometimes new inmates have to commit a new horrific crime while they are in prison to be accepted by the so-called shot callers who direct the inmates' activities. The new inmates need others to see them as truly bad and evil just to fit in with the other bad and evil persons who are incarcerated with them. If their self is verified, then the gang with which they affiliate can provide them a modicum of protection. Which leads us to the next topic, self-evaluations. Many textbooks refer to this as self-evaluation with three sub-traits. But the research literature recently has decided there's another name for it, core self-evaluation, and it has four sub-traits or components. The construct of core self-evaluations is how we feel about ourselves deep down inside. It is comprised of four different traits that combine together in a kind of macro hodgepodge of lower level traits. The first one is self-esteem. This is very similar to self-concept, but it essentially involves how much value we have regarding ourselves as a person. Do we think we're a good person or a not so good person? If we think we're a good person, then we have high self-esteem. That is, we hold ourselves in high regard or esteem. If we're unsure of our value or worth as a person, then we might have a medium level or amount of self-esteem. If we believe categorically that we are not a good person, then we would have low self-esteem. Low self-esteem, or self-esteem in general, I'm sorry, can fluctuate over time, but remains near a certain internal set point unless something profound changes it. Everyone's set point is different. And the changes in self-esteem have a way of settling back down or rising back up to that individual's natural tendency or level. The next part of core self-evaluation is self-efficacy, which is positively correlated with self-esteem, of course. It involves the learned experiences that we have about the probability of success in given situations. Because it is learned, it fluctuates more than does self-esteem. When we experience a failure, we can have some self-doubt about our abilities. And when we experience success, we see a rise in self-efficacy. Most people have that internal set point around which they gravitate on self-efficacy. But the band around the set point is much wider than that which is around self-esteem. This is essentially the sense that we can succeed if and when we apply sufficient effort. We say to ourselves, I can dig that ditch or master that algorithm or sell that product if I try really hard. The next part of core self-evaluation is locus of control. This is actually a personality trait that, like other traits, has a unidimensional spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, we have an internal locus of control. And on the other end, we have an external locus of control. People with a strong internal locus of control tend to believe that they have control over life's events. People with an external locus of control tend to believe in luck or good fortune or bad fortune or that powerful others may control what they experience in their life. Most people fall somewhere in the middle. Sometimes we control things and sometimes things control us. As a personality trait, it's fairly immutable. It develops over time from early childhood and is a combination of heredity and environment. Its set point rarely changes much, but it is different for everybody. In the business world, we tend to want to hire people who have a strong internal locus of control rather than a weak internal locus of control. Again, because it's a unidimensional spectrum, a weak internal locus of control is the same thing as a strong external locus of control. The last component of CSE, as core self-evaluations is sometimes known, the last component is emotional stability. 
This is actually one of the big five factors of personality. The opposite of emotional stability is neuroticism. People with high levels of emotional stability are less likely to be anxious or experience depression or be uncomfortable in novel situations, etc. When we are nervous or anxious, we know it. When we are calm and collected, so to speak, we know it too. Because we are aware of our emotional stability level, the awareness of it affects how we feel deep inside of us. It affects our core self-evaluation. At our very core, how strongly or weakly or how positively or negatively we evaluate ourselves matters greatly. Research of my own and many others has shown that CSE is highly correlated with various forms of subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is akin to satisfaction or happiness and has several facets like life satisfaction, job satisfaction, relationship satisfaction, and even university satisfaction. In my own research regarding university satisfaction for college students, we found that after statistically controlling for all sorts of other things that tend to make students happy with their university experience, like grades, grade fairness, etc., core self-evaluations was the most strongly thing related to university satisfaction. This indicates that how well people feel about themselves deep down inside is predictive of how happy they are with a variety of aspects of their lives. Let's move on. It should be clear that self-concept is not static. It can change over time and within certain roles that we assume in life. However, some aspects of it keep us anchored to certain levels of self-concept. The mechanisms that are involved in the creation and maintenance of our self-concept are very important. There are three such mechanisms. The first is complexity, which is the nature and the number of roles we assume in life. Some of, us, some of us have numerous roles in life as a parent, child, sibling, spouse, employee, member of a charitable group, etc., etc. We hold these roles simultaneously. Some of us have constantly changing roles, like those at work that include the stages of applicant, employee, manager, retiree, etc. The more roles that we assume in our lives, and the more these roles change over time, the more complex our self-concept is. A child with no siblings, has a less complex self-concept than does a married man who works at the local factory and has a wife and three kids. The complexity of our lives changes over time, and to a certain extent, we have control over much of it. Of course, some things are out of our control, like being a child of someone or a sibling of someone, but we do choose to be in adult romantic relationships, and we choose to work at a certain place. When our lives become too complex for us, we sometimes disengage from some roles, like maybe volunteering at the local homeless shelter, serving on a committee at work, fixing the old beat-up car that's parked in the garage, etc., etc. The complexity of our lives affects our self-concept because of the impact of complexity on our ability to see ourselves as worthy individuals, to have others see us as we want to be seen, and to feel good about ourselves to our very core. The second mechanism is consistency, which is the degree to which our various life roles are compatible with each other and with the things that make us who we are and who we see ourselves as. Sometimes the roles we choose or that are forced upon us are in conflict with each other. For example, the job of being a prison guard requires that you adopt one persona at work, but when you go home to your family, we can all hope that your persona changes because your role changes. Switching back and forth from being a sometimes brutal authoritarian to being a sweet dad to three-year-old twin girls is incredibly inconsistent. One can learn to manage those roles with time, but the natural inconsistency between them can underlie changes in our self-concept. Are we good at these two very different roles? Do others see us in these roles as we think we are in them? Does one role shake us to the very core because it is inconsistent with our deep-seated personality traits and or values? 
Some roles require different traits and definitely different behaviors and can make some aspects of how we perceive ourselves to be in conflict because the roles can sometimes be incompatible. The third mechanism underlying self-concept is clarity. Many people really aren't quite sure who they are, especially when they are young. When they are really, really young, they vacillate between wanting to be a fireman and wanting to be a fire truck. As they become teenagers, their future self became more clear to them, and maybe then they switch their identity to either wanting to be a fireman or a policeman. As they grew into adulthood, their self-concept became much more clear as they begin to figure out who they are, what their values are, what their personality is like, how they like to interact with other people, what job they want for a career, etc. As in the Mars model, where role clarity is important in the prediction of behavior, with self-concept, one's clarity is even more important. We both want and need to be stable in our roles. And if we are not, then our lives become increasingly unmanageable and it can be difficult on those around us. In sum, complexity, consistency, and clarity are three mechanisms underlying or contributing to one's self-concept through their impact on our self-enhancement, self-verification, and self-evaluation. Let's move on. Next, we'll turn to a theory about our perception of others. More specifically, it is about others' behavior. This is a course on organizational behavior, after all. Attribution theory helps us understand why certain things happen. The attribution process is a perceptual process of deciding whether an observed behavior or an event is caused mainly by internal or external factors. The theory, the theory was formerly known as perceived phenomenological causality because it tried to answer the question, why did that happen? What caused that phenomenon? What is my perception of the causality of that phenomenon? It's certainly a mouthful, so researchers have settled on attribution theory as its name. Humans are naturally curious, and we want to know why things happen. That is, we want to know what the cause of an event is. We tend to make either an internal attribution or an external attribution on causality. An internal attribution is the perception that the event was due to aspects internal to a person. That is, the person, sometimes called the actor, or something internal to the person was the reason it happened. The cause could be due to motivation or ability of so, or some other inherent personal quality. External attribution is the perception that the event is due to circumstances outside the actor's control. They cannot take credit for it, or conversely, they cannot be blamed for it. To decide if what happened was due to something internal or external to the actor an observer evaluates three different dimensions. Remember, the goal is to determine if the behavior is a product of personal issues or situational factors. The first dimension is the consistency of the behavior. Consistency is the perception that the behavior was very similar to other behaviors or not similar at all. A behavior is classified as highly consistent or frequently consistent if it is similar to other behaviors in the actor's life. If so, then it would have high consistency with the other behaviors in their life and the observer would likely lean towards an internal attribution. A behavior that has low consistency will occur very seldom in the actor's life, so it, it would be inconsistent and the observer can lean towards an external attribution. For example, suppose you see a manager berating a subordinate employee you wonder why it is occurring. You want to determine if the cause of beratement is internal or external to the manager. We're looking at the manager, not the employee being berated. In this case, the manager is the actor and you are the observer. Maybe the manager is just a jerk. That would be an internal attribution. Or maybe the situation actually called for a reprimand. That would be an external attribution. You first need to determine if the behavior is highly consistent with the manager's other behavior. If the manager also berates other employees on a near daily basis, 
The cause of the event is more likely to be internal to the manager than external. If, on the other hand, the manager has never berated any employee, then the behavior is of low consistency because it seldom occurs, and we can probably chalk it up to something external to the manager. Think of this dimension as same person, same behavior. The next dimension is distinctiveness. Low distinctiveness is where the behavior is similar to other behaviors in an actor. Low distinctiveness indicates that it is not distinct from the other behaviors. It is not unusual at all because it is common. High distinctiveness is when the behavior is very different and seldom encountered by the manager. That is, it is uncommon. Let's go back to the example of the manager berating an employee at work. Is this behavior distinctive, uncommon, or unlike other behaviors by the manager? Alternatively, is the behavior common and therefore has low distinctiveness? Suppose in our example, the manager has been employee of the year for two years in a row. He recently thwarted a robbery at the workplace and saved the company thousands of dollars. The manager is the model employee in every way. This would lead you, the observer, to think that the cause of behavior is external to them. If, on the other hand, the manager has engaged in numerous acts of counterproductive work behavior, such as altering timesheets, drinking beer on lunch breaks, etc., then the behavior has low distinctiveness because such behaviors are frequent and not distinct with the manager. So the observer, you, can attribute its cause to something internal to the actor. Think of this dimension as same person, different behavior. The third dimension to consider is consensus. This dimension describes whether the behavior that the observer witnesses is similar to behavior that other managers or actors also exhibit. It ranges from high consensus to low consensus. A behavior that has high consensus is also frequently exhibited by others. A behavior that low, has low consistent, consensus excuse me, is rarely exhibited by others. In the ongoing example, the observer assesses the consensus of the event by examining whether other managers at work berate employees frequently or not. If the observer has only witnessed one such outburst in 10 years, then it occurs seldom and has low consist, consensus with other behaviors exhibited by other people. That perception would lean towards an internal attribution. The managerial behavior is so rare that the employee absolutely must have done something to deserve it. If this is the, say, third outburst by a third manager just today, and never a week goes by without a dozen or so managerial outbursts from every manager that are directed at employees, then the behavior has high consensus because it is common for others to do. In essence, there is consensus that screaming at subordinates in the workplace is okay, and the attribution is external. Think of this dimension as different person, same behavior. In most cases, all three dimensions will line up to determine if the attribution of causality should be internal or external to the actor. However, an observer only really needs two of the three dimensions to point in the same direction to make a fairly accurate assessment of whether the cause of the behavior is internal to the actor or external to the actor. Let's move on. Despite the fact that only two of these three dimensions of attribution theory are needed to point to the underlying cause of an event, there is still a large possibility of error. The first error to think about is called fundamental attribution error, which is an error we make about other people when we automatically attribute causality for an event to something internal to them. Humans naturally like to assign blame for circumstances that affect others to something internal to the other person. For example, imagine a busy factory with hundreds of employees working hard. There's one employee who seems to be always getting hurt. He takes more sick leave than anyone and has more visits to the company nurse than anyone else. Suddenly, one day, the workers hear a loud crash and an ensuing scream of agony. 
The factory foreman walks over shaking his head, expecting Goofy Gordon, as he is known in the workplace, to be in some other self-imposed predicament. However, the foreman arrives only to see a ladder with seven rungs broken in it and Gordon's leg twisted amongst the pile of wood. The quick easy assignment of causality was that the accident was probably internal to Goofy Gordon because of his accident-prone past. But upon further inspection, it was clearly external to Gordon. The foreman has committed the fundamental attribution error, which occurs when we assign causality to something internal to someone, but in reality, it is external to them. The second error is also part of attribution theory. It regards errors we make about ourselves. It is called the self-serving bias when we automatically attribute causality to something external to us, when in reality, it was internal to us. The self-serving bias occurs when we make errors about ourself and we try and attribute causality to things external to our control. We engage in a self-serving bias to deflect the blame for events away from us to other things instead. This happens all the time. Think about the classroom, for example. Suppose the students gather outside the classroom after a test has been handed back and the grades have been posted. One student will say to the other, well, how'd you do? The other student responds with, I aced that test. Man, I studied hard. I am so proud of myself. I earned an A. After the next test, the same students meet outside the classroom. In response to the same question, the student answers completely differently and says, that son of a gun gave me an F. The student has likely made the perceptual error of self-serving bias. They earned the A the first time, but the F was mysteriously given by the professor. In their error-prone minds, they didn't earn the F. It was someone else's fault. In review, the self-serving bias is a perceptual error we make about events involving us, and a fundamental attribution error is a perceptual error we make about events involving other people. Let's turn now to other sorts of errors that we make in our perception. Halo error occurs when one particularly good trait or event helps form an overall favorable impression of someone else, despite their many other shortcomings. In Texas years ago, there was a TV commercial for Whataburger restaurants. The tagline went like this. Don't be the guy who's late to work on Friday. Be the guy who brings breakfast tacos for everyone to work on Friday. The fact that the guy brings breakfast tacos to work every Friday makes up for all of his other shortcomings like tardiness. There may be other shortcomings too, but the halo around him for bringing breakfast to everyone on Fridays cleans up his aura enough that others overlook his shortcomings. Horn error is the opposite of halo error. One bad trait can help form a generally unfavorable impression that overshadows all other traits despite their merit. For example, this might be someone who has bad personal hygiene. Maybe they're the best employee at the company and once saved everyone from a factory fire, but their hygiene affects how others perceive them and people just can't get past it. They don't care that the smelly person saved their life and is the best employee. The employee stinks and that's all that matters. The one bad characteristic overshadows all of the other commendable characteristics. It's an error because the person is overall a good employee. Another error is called false consensus. It is also known as, or AKA, also known as similar to me error and sometimes also known as projection bias. They mean basically the same thing. And this is the belief that other people do the same things and have the same attitudes and traits as we do. For example, we might believe that having a neat and tidy office is the key to success. This could lead us to be demeaning about untidy offices and belittle the person who works in an untidy office. If you're not similar to me, and who would not be similar to me, that's an error we make about other people. Maybe the person is a fantastic person. They just don't have a tidy office. Big deal. We tend to project our traits upon others and automatically assume that others have those traits as well. Maybe we're super punctual at work and we believe that everyone else should be super punctual to work also. If someone is late to work just once, we automatically think negatively of them. This is an error that we make about that other person who dares to be different from us. Primacy error is regarding first impressions. 
With primacy or first error, we make a mistake about the perception of a person based upon first impression. The first impression dominates our perception of everything else. The person simply cannot shake that first impression. For example, research has shown that being late to a job interview can affect the overall impression of the applicant. The tardiness is more than just a measure of punctuality. It's the very first interaction we have with a future coworker. Tardiness to an interview can negatively impact your interview score and therefore maybe even the chances that you get the job. Maybe you do get the job, but the fact that you showed up late for the job interview just seems to never go away in the interviewer's mind. It colors their perception of everything about you. Recency error is the opposite of primacy error. It's an error that occurs about the most recent information that we have about a person and it dominates our perception of other things about that person. For example, suppose you are a salesperson with a sales quota. At some point you go in for your performance review and you have not met the quota. However, the day before your performance appraisal, you set a new company record with a massive sale. It wasn't large enough to meet your quota, but that outstanding new record sale can color the supervisor's perception of you in their mind. The supervisor does not fire you as she would have because you didn't meet the quota, but instead commends you on the record sale yesterday. It might be an error to not fire you. Maybe you just got lucky or you sold the product to your brother-in-law and he's going to return it the day after your performance appraisal. Who knows? Another perceptual error that we often make is contrast error. This error arises when there are vast perceived differences between two things. Both things may be adequate, but the excellence of one makes the other appear less than favorable. For example, let's go back to the performance appraisal example. Let's say that maybe there's five subordinates all sitting in the outer office room waiting to go in one by one to meet with the supervisor. You happen to be in line, so to speak, but you're right behind the star employee. The star walks in, gives their glowing report, gets a big giant bear hug from the boss, gets a raise, and the Employee of the Year award. Then you have to go in. You might be a fantastic employee in your own right, but you will pale in comparison to the star employee. That is, your performance appraisal score will be downwardly affected by contrast error because of the perceived differences between you and the star employee. Let's move on. Thanks. That's all, folks.